Good morning, everybody. Try it again. Thank you. Thank you. Much better. Um, again, uh, just to repeat the thanks to the organizers, Jeff and Rod, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, it would be worth it to come here, obviously, to attend, to learn from all the experts that have been here. It's an honor uh, to have the opportunity to do what I hope I'll be able to do, which is to uh, offer you some information that will help as we try to convey this, I think, most important message to whatever part of the world we happen to be operating in. Uh, and, and I think it's really good work. Um, disclosure, I have no interest to disclose by my understanding. But in the interest of full transparency, just to let you know, I'm an advocate for the low carb, high fat way of eating uh, and ruminant animal agriculture. I've gotten to go around the country and to many other countries and speak about these topics and speak to the ruminant animal agricultural industries about the vital message that we've been hearing about from the experts so far and will continue to hear about. Um, I've worked in forage agriculture for most of my adult life and I presently work for a forage seed company but I am not here in any capacity as a representative of that company. I am here as a private individual. I'm self-funded to be here. Um, so I get to talk to people who are involved in production agriculture um, and they need to hear this message. Um, I, my, my formal training is in agronomy, which would involve soil science and plant sciences. And of course, there's interactions in between those two. Uh, as a ruminant nutritionist, uh, I focused on the wonder that is the ruminant animal. And what I hope to be able to give you today is some answers to the pushback that we frequently hear about can we sustain a diet that has more animal products in it or uh, some other things that frequently come up. Uh, like many people, I've had my own personal health journey. I started on a low carbohydrate, high fat diet back in 2007, had my own moment of clarity and fortunately there were resources then available like Protein Power Life Plan, and that's more or less what I've been following since then. And that triggered in me a keen interest in doing informal research and education, if you will, on the debacle that is public health policy, human nutrition, and as someone who's trained in animal nutrition, the contrast with human nutrition is so profound I can't begin to explain it to you. Um, but of course, there are interactions between all of these, okay? And it's only prosperous societies that can really have the luxury of taking care of their environment, things like that. And so I started talking and writing about something that I call grass-based health. And I've been doing that now for several years. Uh, I'm a shameless leverager. <laughs> In academia, they call that plagiarism. It's a bad thing. Um, and so Sean Baker, uh, a little while ago, posted this on Twitter. Wouldn't it be amazing if there were a single food that tasted great, provided complete nutrition, and caused muscle gain and fat loss? <laughs> and so leveraging that. I said, yeah, wouldn't it be really amazing if there were a way to convert inedible materials into high quality food for humans, utilize that portion of the Earth's surface that cannot produce human utilizable foodstuffs while improving the environment and improving human health and increasing human flourishing. Oh wait, ruminants rule. <laughs> and um, thank you. I see we've got some members of the Ruminati in the audience. I'm looking for more. <laughs> Part of my mission is to educate whoever we can reach on the vital nature of ruminants and the vital nature of the products that we get from ruminant agriculture. Butter, meat, and cheese, to quote a certain author, uh, belong in a healthy diet. But as we all know, for several decades, they've been slandered. They've been unfairly accused of being health hazards. But these are the products of forage agriculture. 
And I, my contention in some talks that I give is that these represent true health food, not the health food industry and its products and that long history. But I came across this quote the other day. I, I first actually heard somebody on the radio say this quote, and then I had to go look it up. The great enemy of truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. Too often we hold fast to the cliches of our forebears. We subject all facts to a prefabricated set of interpretations. We enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. <laughs> I'm sorry to say it, but the realm of human nutrition, public health, is been suffering from too long from an over-application of male bovine fecal matter. <laughs> and it's organic. <laughs> the problem, I'm not the only one to point this out, but I think we need to recognize that we got the dietary guidelines as the result of one the very peculiar strain of vegetarianism that sprang up in the mid-19th century in America, which was a religiously motivated, moralistic movement. Thank you, John Harvey Kellogg. <laughs> you know, women shouldn't eat meat because it makes them lustful harpies. Um, <laughs> why that's a problem, I don't know. but. <laughs> And, and we then carry that forward and we combine it with the environmentalism that emerged in the 60s and the 70s. And these movements are still with us today. And if we don't recognize that and the role they play in numerous controversies, we may not be able to make the progress that we hope to be able to make. You can tell when idols are being worshipped because human beings are being sacrificed. This is a lot to do with belief. This is a lot to do with religion and religion replacement. Um, and I have a standard of value which places humans and their flourishing as my focus and goal. And I think that's what we're talking about here is helping people be as much, achieve as much as they can to, to, to get away, get freedom from chronic illness. Too often the conversation, however, is on minimizing human impact. And what people don't realize is while that sounds good, you can't achieve maximum human flourishing if your initial goal is minimizing human impact. The irony is, if we will pursue maximizing human flourishing, we will get to minimizing human impact. Today in the world, we have a billion people that have never experienced electricity and all that comes with that. So let's kind of keep some of these things in mind as we go forward. Gerald Reeven, what is required is less advice and more information. I think that that's what we should be focusing on. Tell me meaningful biomarkers, tell me meaningful testing, tell me meaningful data, and then let's work at monitoring and, and going forward. And so what I hope I can do is give you some information. You know, they say that if you're in a group of people you agree with 100%, you're probably in a cult. <laughs> My role here today may be to prove that LCHF is not a cult. <laughs> And that's okay, we can disagree without being disagreeable. Um, I'm gonna just basically have these sort of basic um, points of understanding regarding human health because there are people far more qualified uh, have talked about these already. And, and, but basically, this quote from uh, Professor Slavin, um, nutrition research does not support that vegetarian diets are healthier than animal-based product uh, diets. Uh, the hypothesis that natural saturated fats from animal products causes vascular diseases has been refuted. 
The hypothesis that dietary cholesterol led to vascular diseases was never supported by research. It was primarily a marketing campaign promoting plant product replacements for animal products. Animal protein is superior to plant protein for human nutrition. Polyunsaturated fatty acids from plants have been shown to produce harm in humans. And diets high in animal products and restricted in carbohydrates have been shown to produce greater weight loss, better blood glucose control, reduced cardiovascular disease uh, than low fat diets. Okay, so that's the premise that I operate from. We, as human beings, have had a very long relationship with ruminants. <laughs> we did not evolve to eat meat. We evolved because we ate meat. And also because we learned how to cook and chop and grind and ferment and process, you know, food, um, which is a whole other conversation. But the, uh, the image that we have on the far side, uh, I guess the left, side of the screen is uh, a skeleton of the auric, which was the prehistoric ancestor of modern day cattle. And next to that, we have a cave painting from about 20,000 some years ago. Um, amazingly absent is the image of the uh, sacred soybean plant. <laughs> For a modern disease to be related to an old-fashioned food, in this case red meat, is one of the most ludicrous things I have ever heard in my life. 1973, testifying to the Senate subcommittee, trying to say you're on the wrong track. Okay, here's a little quiz. Again, I'm a shameless leverager. I got this from uh, Dr. Barry Groves. If you've seen it, don't help your neighbors. No cheating. Which mammals are designed to digest a low-fat diet? We have group A, those are sheep, cattle, mountain gorilla. Group B, modern humans, African lion, polar bear. How many people think that group A is designed to digest a low-fat diet? How many people think group B is designed to digest a low-fat diet? Trick question, y'all. There's a difference between digest and ingest. And the trick here is that while a cow, for example, will ingest a diet of roughly 5% or less crude fat, she will end up absorbing almost 70% of her energy from volatile fatty acids that were produced in microbial fermentation. And we'll get into that. So human beings don't have a rumen. Some of us look like we do, but we really don't. Um, lions, polar bears, obviously, these animals, when we have carnivores or omnivores, we have different digestive systems. We must have substances in our diets that ruminants do not have to have. Now, mountain gorillas accomplish the same trick, but they have an enlarged cecum. They use post-gastric fermentation. They also have a delightful little practice that they call coprophagy, which I urge you to all look up sometime <laughs> later. So the next time a vegan says, eat like a gorilla, you can say no. Sh um. <laughs> now, I know it's really hard to imagine that there could be substances that are absolutely vital to health and welfare and have people launch massive campaigns about how these things are harmful. I know, it's hard to imagine. All life on Earth is carbon-based, essentially, right? It's carbon dioxide is absolutely essential to life on Earth. Without it, no photosynthesis. Without photosynthesis, no chemical energy for us to harvest, no oxygen for us to breathe. If I could magically take 38% of the CO2 that's currently in the atmosphere out of the atmosphere, plant growth would stagnate. Okay? All life is dependent on cycling of CO2. So we're going to take radiant energy from the sun, and we are dependent on these photoautotrophic organisms, plants in this case, that are going to take carbon dioxide and water, and they're going to form carbohydrates and oxygen. Then heterotrophic organisms like a cow, like us, 
like other animals, we then are dependent on those autotrophic organisms for energy for life. Now, the problem here is that the most abundant carbohydrate in the biosphere is cellulose. And the difference between cellulose and starch is the bonding between glucose units. That's it. They're both polymers of glucose. No vertebrate makes cellulase. So the breakdown of this most abundant carbohydrate is entirely dependent on microorganisms that produce cellulase. Maybe it's not too surprising that of the 47 species that man has domesticated around the world, that three quarters of those are herbivores. Taking this resource that we can't utilize directly and converting it into feed sources that we can. And ruminants represent 45% of the total domesticated species, 21 species. So it's more than just, you know, cows and sheep and goats. There are 134 species of ruminants. Um, they're not competitive to humans. So when we get into conversations with people, they're not competitive. They convert plant protein, which really isn't protein, it's just nitrogenous material content that we multiply by a number and say that's crude protein. I'll uh, get into that later. And then the low nutrient density organic materials that can be converted into high quality animal products. There's some other key functions that they play. Draft is one. Uh, if you enjoy wearing leather belts or shoes, that's another product that we get. Numerous byproducts that we get from animals, not just meat and milk. Quick review. Simple stomached animals like your pig, your chicken, rats, us. Um, we have macro, the diet coming in, carbohydrate, proteins, fat, enters into gastric digestion. And then in the intestines, we have the absorption of sugars, amino acids, and fatty acids. The ruminants add on this anaerobic fermentation vat in front of the gastric digestive system. Their diet is primarily carbohydrate and protein. Within that microbial fermentation process, we have methane produced. We'll talk about that. We have volatile fatty acids produced. We have ammonia produced. Then that digesta flows eventually into the true stomach, uh, the abomasum, where it begins the gastric digestive process. From the intestine, there's very little glucose that gets absorbed. Very little sugar, it's all been fermented. Your cows are in constant ketosis. I don't know, ruminants rule. Um, and the amino acids that they end up digesting are primarily microbial. There is no such thing as an essential amino acid in a ruminant diet. The bugs make the protein that they need. So that's a tremendously important ecological role. Just kind of a diagram here. The reticular rumen is actually one large body. There are different regions. Uh, but basically, the ruminant animal, and you can imagine why this would be an advantage, is going to harvest a great deal of material as quickly as possible and then go off to a safe place where it can then process that material through the process of rumination. And basically, what it's trying to do is it's trying to break down that material to provide more surface area for the microbes to work at, to digest the fiber. Any plant, any cell contents that come in are almost completely digestible within the rumen. Uh, and then fiber digestion varies based on a number of factors that I won't bore you with because it's for, forage geeky stuff. But here's, here's, the, here's the, the great thing right here. That if you know what you're doing and you do it right from New Zealand, we have cows that are capable of producing five and a third pounds of milk solids out of grass a day. And this, is, this is a resource we can't use. And 
if I had the time, I could tell you why grass agriculture is better for the environment than row crop ag agriculture. But that's a lot of material. 130 kilograms of fresh weight that she's got to harvest and cram into a rumen and then break down and get it out so that more can come in the next day. That's a lot of tongue work because that's the way the cow eats. She doesn't have opposable thumbs. She has to like grab it with her tongue and pull it in so it's got to be high enough and dense enough. Okay, sorry, geeky. So that's, <laughs> the milk solids are approximately a third milk fat, a third lactose, and then about a quarter um, protein. Again, out of grass. And if you look worldwide, Ruminants are really important for our worldwide economy. Something a little over $433 billion. Six of the top 50 ag commodities in the world are ruminant animal products. So if we're going to make do without animals, what impact does that have? Little over a quarter of the world meat supply is coming from ruminants. There's a lot of reasons behind all that. Pork and poultry are much higher in terms of the meat supply. We can change that. Um, but again, how are we going to replace that food if we're going to go to some other food that isn't as efficient? So we have a challenge coming at us in about 33 years. They're saying that the there are going to be two billion more people in the world. Because this isn't just here in affluent, comfortable North America. This is a worldwide thing. How are we going to feed this growing population, especially when it's a growingly prosperous population? And as populations become more prosperous, they want more animal products. Remarkable that. So they're saying a 60% increase in demand for animal products by 2050, and the FA, uh, sorry, 100% increase in total food production uh, is going to be needed, and then that 60% increase in animal products. Uh, this is one of their statements. I'm going to argue with this one just a little bit. They're saying that this has to come from virtually the same land area as today. Well, here we go. This is what we got to do it with. Two-thirds of the Earth's surface is ocean. There are things that we can talk about. I'm not qualified to deal with that. Um, the second largest surface type of the Earth is rangeland. This is ground that cannot, should not be used for the production of human crops. We've done it. It's a bad idea. We keep having to relearn that. But that's, you know, the nature of the environment. Then we have forest, non-productive land like glaciers, deserts, the Arctic. Cultivated land only represents 4% of the Earth's surface. And then urban industrial is 1%. Anybody who lives in Colorado along the Front Range might be familiar with what happens to productive farmland as urban areas expand. That tends to be where the expansion takes place. So we're losing that arable land at a rate that makes me question that last point on the previous slide. But my point is that we can meet the needs by improving our management and utilization of our rangelands and the efficiency of our ruminant agricultural systems. Just very quickly to look at this, this is population of cattle, both beef and dairy, worldwide, segmented by regions. And so the North America is kind of there between 12 and 1 o'clock, and then down towards, you know, 3.30 and 5 is, is Europe. And you can see it's about 12%. Uh, in both cases of the total population of cattle in each of those regions. But look what, and, and then look, for example, at India or Pakistan, where you have a larger percentage, or South America. <clears throat> but if you start looking at the productivity of those animals, 
you begin to see that there's this opportunity to increase the efficiency of those animals in those other regions. And as we get more efficient, we have less of an environmental impact. Okay. I mean, it's interesting for me to see that you, I, I was kind of surprised when I looked at this. Um, I'm, you know, I'm American. And um, I looked at the data and I thought America would be a bigger percentage of the animals in the production. Look at Europe. Almost half of the milk worldwide is coming from Europe from 12 or 13 percent of the animals. So I make the point. <laughs> I make the point that there would not be modern humans without ruminants, that ruminants are vital to our current ex situation, and they will be vital to our future. Okay. I just want to quickly go through a, a quickly, Pete, really quickly, uh, a few of the common arguments that come up. And I'm really interested in, in getting more of these, and I'll tell you about that toward the end. Um, I, I frequently hear people talk about, you know, the grain-fed cattle. And if you, the, part of the problem is our terms. We finish the majority of our beef animals on rations that contain grain. It's not 100% grain. It's not even all human edible grain that we use. We have this artificial distinction within the animal nutrition realm. We, we used to talk about roughages and concentrates. So a, constant, a, a grain will be a concentrate, but a concentrate could also be something like vegetable processing waste. So it's, it, a lot of what gets used in these systems is also not utilizable by human beings. It would be buried in a landfill, for example. Um, so, if you looked at the entire beef cow herd, over 80% of the feed that goes into feeding all the beef cows in North America, in the U.S., is forage. Again, grass or other plants not utilizable by us. Of course, when we move into that finishing phase for those animals, we're going to flip those almost and we're going to get a three quarters, 70% of the diet coming from this higher energy feed, but they're still gonna get a quarter of their ration coming from forage. And then if you look at the line below, you can see that virtually no grain concentrate goes into the, the cows and the bulls and the replacement heifers. You can also see the difference between ruminants and uh, poultry or swine. If you hear somebody talk to you about 10 pounds of grain to make a pound of beef or whatever that number is, they're, they're, they're pulling it out of their... So where, where, where they got wrong is they're looking at the total ration and they're saying the total ration is grain. And they're saying, okay, it's 10 pounds of corn to make a pound of beef. But as I just explained, that's wrong. It's the total ration, which may or may not contain variable portions of human utilizable products. That varies by the region. That's one of the things. The beef industry is remarkably dispersed across the United States. So if you were to look at human utilizable feed grain, it's like two and a half to one. Total ration today, modern systems, it's more like six or seven to one. They're working hard to bring that down. There's a lot of economic pressure. Um, should also point out that dairy blows away everybody else. Um, beef is actually more efficient than producing pork uh, or poultry. Um, again, I mentioned before this idea of taking non-protein, uh, non-protein nitrogen and making animal protein out of it, even if we feed human utilizable protein to a ruminant, we will get more back than we feed in. And so in a dairy, it's like two pounds back for every pound in. With beef cattle, it's about one to one, far better than pork or poultry. This is a crime. 
based on the current recommendations for protein intake, 40% of Americans aren't getting enough protein. Okay. And if you want to talk about a war on women, most females over the age of eight aren't getting enough protein. And the problem is worse because they're equating plant protein with animal protein. So the number's worse than this. We knew a long time ago that animal protein was superior to plant protein, but that's kind of awkward when we start recommending plant-based uh, diets, right? That's kind of awkward. So we just ignore that. It's still in the textbooks, but we won't talk about it. Also, I hear a lot about percent of calories from protein. And that's just an inaccurate way to deal with protein in human diets. There's a quantifiable number. There's some amount of protein that we each need. It's going to vary. I don't know what it is for anyone. Find that target, and then the rest of the diet kind of flows around that. But you understand that if you have a fixed amount, like 30 grams per meal, of high-quality protein, and then you start varying the percentage or your total calories, and you're trying to do that by a percentage number, that's going to throw off the quantity. Right? OK. Uh, very quickly, we can run these examples where we look at beef muscle cooked and navy beans cooked and the amount of crude protein that's in each. And you see, yeah, by goodness, you know, navy beans has a little bit more crude protein in that amount. Crude protein is the percent nitrogen determined by analysis multiplied by 6.25 because we assume that all the nitrogen present is in protein and we assume that all the protein is 16% nitrogen. Right? That, that's how we get that number. Okay, so just because it's there doesn't mean it's digestible. You start looking at those numbers, you see them start to diverge. Just because you digest it doesn't mean you can utilize it. There's a concept called biological value. And at the end of the day, you can see there's now a threefold difference, essentially, it, between the usable protein for a human being out of those two equal amounts. And then there was the old concept of complete protein. <laughs> Detoxing, I know it's a... Um, I don't want to get too far off on that, but there are, there's things in plants we don't want to be eating. Um, and polyunsaturated fats are one of them. One of the things that happens in the rumen is that those saturated bonds are broken because of the nature of the anaerobic environment. And so the detoxifying of this plant material, converting it into high quality animal products for human beings. Um, this is just an example of how contaminated this conversation has gotten. Here's a gentleman from uh, Australia. Uh, carbon cows is a YouTube video that you can find. Cows are nature's carbon uh, capture technology as well as a cheap source of protein for the world. And Pete can't help himself, so he edits. And he says, and all other ruminants. And then he edits, and fat because we've become so lipophobic in the industry, we can't even talk about the fat that we produce. So we emphasize our product as being lean, yada, yada, yada. Um, if you're really interested in carbon capture, if you're having a serious conversation about that, and too often we aren't, um, grazing systems is the best and only viable method of carbon capture. Here's documentation of a, a three-tenths of a percent increase in soil carbon per year from converting cropland into irrigated pas uh, dairy pasture in Georgia. If you then start applying those numbers to just a small percentage of the southeastern U.S. alone, what those numbers show is it has never been about the emissions from cattle. It's been about something else. Okay, we can talk about that. Uh, we need to be focusing on the water cycle, not the carbon cycle. This is just a demonstration of the difference of soil structure that occurs under long-term grass cover as compared to row cropping, you know, when we produce those healthy vegetables. Um, Grass-fed beef is not lean. Uh, the omega-6 to omega-3 thing comes up frequently. I just wanted to point out from research station, uh, studies, the tremendous variation in those ratios. They're nowhere near as consistent as people will frequently state them. 
And then if we start looking a, a little deeper at this, we can see that, yeah, this questionable four to one target that we got from Harvard, um, this, this data comes from a combination of a research study and then marketplace samples. And so you can see, yeah, four to one is your target. You can see the grass fed is lower. You can see the grain fed is a little bit higher. That was from the, that research station or study. But then also look at where the chicken and the pork rests. So if you're telling me you have to have grass fed beef to get this desirable ratio, that's fine. You know, I'd say God bless America, but I know this is an international audience I wouldn't want to offend. <laughs> But if that's your driving goal, then you should know you should not be eating pork or chicken. Okay, and I got nothing against pork or chicken. Love me some barbecue. The other problem here is that when you look at soybean oil, that ratio is actually better than pork or chicken. And we know that has to be nonsense, right? Well, yeah, of course it's nonsense. It's a quantity issue. Beef. Any ruminant flesh, regardless of how it's finished, is not a rich source of omega-6 or omega-3. Hormones is another non-issue. Uh, just showing you here very quickly the difference between implanted and non-implanted beef and the hormones you would get comparing that to some other feedstuffs, comparing that to what humans produce. These have always been canards that get thrown out. And if we could have the conversation, we could answer some of these other issues as well. And I'm interested in doing that to help us become more effective advocates for the diet. Because I'm concerned we're putting unnecessary barriers in front of adoption. Um, so I know um, I need input. If you have questions, if you have comments, if you have concerns, uh, we will have a question and answer period later, um, but my contact information, um, I'm available, I'm interested in, in kind of doing some more of this. So apologies for the time and thank you very much.